Oh, uh, hello. Yeah, it's is my voice good now? Is it good now? Right. So, hello and welcome, everybody. It's kind of loud. Uh, my name is Sahara Hedari I'm an assistant professor of philosophy and a member of the steering committee at the Center for Ethics and Human Values. And on behalf of the center, I want to welcome you all for joining us for this very special event, our distinguished lecture in ethics that has featured amazing scholars in the past. and. And not another very amazing scholar today, uh, including people like Elizabeth Anderson and Martia Sen, um, Miranda Fricker, Daniel Allen, and many others. And today we have a very special person with us, Dr. Michelle Moody Adams. Before uh, introducing her, I want to first thank everyone who has made this event possible. Dr. Pierce Turner, Dr. Erin Yarmel, uh, Dr. Kate McFarland, who's not in the room today with us, and everyone else who has made um, it easy for us to get together and make this event work. Uh, I also want to say um, a few notes about the procedure of this talk. Dr. Moody Adams will deliver her talk titled Controlling the Narrative, Meaning, Value, and Power in Public Life. And after that, I'm going to moderate a Q&A um, session. And uh, if you are present here, I just want to, I want to ask you to um, line up behind the microphone so you can ask your question. If you're participating online, um, use the chat function to share your question and Aaron will um, read your question on your behalf and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And with that, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Moody Adams, uh, who is a Joseph Strout Professor of Political Philosophy and Legal Theory at Columbia University, where she served as Dean of Columbia College and Vice President for Undergraduate Education. Before Columbia, she taught at Cornell University, where she was um, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and Director of the Program on Ethics and Public Life. She has also taught at, at Wellesley College, the University of Rochester, and Indiana University, where she served as an Associate Dean. Her scholarship includes work on equality and social justice, moral psychology and the virtues, the philosophical implications of gender and race, and as many of you, especially my students now, important work on social and moral progress. And all of these topics are manifested in the best way possible in her most recent book, Making Space for Justice, Social Movements, Collective Imagination, and Political Hope. She's also the author of other very well received books on moral relativism, and another titled Fieldwork in Familiar Places, Morality, Culture, and Philosophy. Her current work includes articles on the moral importance of studying history, academic freedom, equal educational opportunity, and democratic disagreement. She's currently working on two other books, um, one titled Renewing Democracy, and another book on the thought of Martin Luther King Jr. Moody Adams has a BA, from Wellesley College, a second day from Oxford University, and earned the MA and PhD in philosophy from Harvard University. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has been a British Marshall Scholar and an NEH Fellow, and a lifetime honorary fellow of Somerville College, Oxford. Dr. Moody Adam, I'm very glad that you're with us today. Please. Thank you so much. That was really very kind. <laughs> so um, it's often said that human beings are storytelling animals. But I think the deeper truth is that we are meaning-making animals for whom telling stories, or more broadly, creating narrative schemes, can be a way of making the world intelligible. The pursuit of intelligibility takes many forms. So we describe experiences, we report facts, we construct theories regarding causes and effects, and we make arguments to justify actions and conclusions. But as Hannah Arendt maintains, and I quote, no philosophy, no analysis, no aphorism, be it ever so profound, can compare in intensity and richness of meaning with a properly narrated story. Now, of course, narrative is a technique for communicating meaning as well as making it, and thus, I second James Fellin's view that narrative is rhetorical action. But I would resist his analysis of that action as a matter of, and he, as he puts it, somebody telling somebody else that something happened, 
because some narrative schemes are essentially private projects through which we seek to make the world intelligible to ourselves. And indeed, the existence of private narratives shows that narrative schemes come in many varieties. So they include projects as different as carefully crafted novels that display the richness of one author's imagination, news stories written by reporters seeking to track the truth, and myths and legends of disputed or unknown origin. The psychologist Donald Polkinghorne even reminds us that a narrative scheme can make an intelligible whole out of just two events. When we join the claims, Harry stubbed his toe, and Harry winced in pain into a single narrative scheme, Harry winced in pain when he stubbed his toe, Harry's behavior becomes an intelligible response to injury. And as this example suggests, a central element of narrative meaning making is positing temporal connections between actions, events, and states of affairs. But Nelson Goodman rightly cautions that even when narratives are meant to track the truth, the order of telling need not follow the order in which events occurred. Now, of special significance to moral and political thought, I should say to social and political thought, is how often the meaning making accomplished by narrative is also world making, to borrow Nelson Goodman's famous phrase. In such cases, we can appreciate the truth in the old saying that those who tell the stories rule the world. And it's particularly important to recognize that most socially dominant narratives decisively regulate the social worlds they help to create. The regulation works in part by constraint. As Alistair McIntyre contends in After Virtue, dominant narratives define social roles that limit what we can intelligibly say do and even be. But such constraints often remain unchallenged because narrative can also be a way of generating consent. And in fact, Hannah Arendt was especially interested in the uses of storytelling to bring about consent and reconciliation with things as they really are. Yet the narrative processes that produce social constraint and manufacture consent are usually intertwined, as we learn in book three of Plato's Republic, where the Platonic Socrates insists that a well-run city needs a founding myth. He proposes a noble lie, the myth of the metals in the earthborn, hoping to ensure that the division of classes in the ideal city would be accepted as a natural order. Yet if we understand the social power of narrative as mainly a matter of communicating constraints on the one hand and manufacturing consent on the other, we may overlook uses of narrative that can actually be socially transformative in service of justice. We can sometimes draw on the power of narrative to expose injustice in existing institutions and then to stimulate reflection on possibilities for transcending the social constraints that help to sustain injustice. McIntyre isn't optimistic about such projects because in his view, and this is a quote from McIntyre, we are never more and sometimes less than the co-authors of our own narratives, end quote. However, when social movements have actually turned to narrative to challenge injustice, they've shown that we can sometimes retell socially dominant narratives in ways that profoundly transform their meaning and their social implications. And retelling a socially, socially dominant narrative can actually be a catalyst for rethinking and remaking the social worlds we inhabit. This is why Salman Rushdie was right to insist, as he did when he uh, spoke at the 200th anniversary of the First Amendment, after a thousand days in seclusion, I quote, those who do not have the power of the story that dominates their lives, power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless because they cannot think new thoughts." End quote. And in fact, this project of creating opportunities to think new thoughts by actively retelling a dominant narrative is a critical element of what I describe in my book, Making Space for Justice, as emancipatory narrative activism, which is a project that involves retelling disempowering narratives in terms that are meant to further the cause of freedom from injustice. And in the book, I actually analyze several examples of this kind of activism to reveal that it typically involves one or more of four projects. First, 
correcting assumptions that marginalize and stigmatize certain groups. Second, conveying knowledge of what it's like to occupy social role shaped by those assumptions. Offering new ways of understanding connections between a group's past experience of injustice and possibilities for a liberated future. And fourth, sometimes just declaring a group's intention to resist discrimination and oppression and to reject the stigmatizing and marginalizing elements of a given narrative. And in fact, in the book, I argue that um, slave, 19th century slave narratives were extremely powerful examples of this kind of activism that in fact undertook all four projects. And I suggest that recent Native American challenges to certain ways of thinking about Native American history, which I'll talk about at the end of this, of this paper, um, is an unfolding project of emancipatory narrative act activism. And I also showed that when such activism is successful, it's actually a means of controlling the narrative by reshaping understandings of who has value and challenging conventional ways of organizing social power. But what I did not do in that book was address a question that might remain even after people have considered the convincing examples. That's the question of how precisely is narrative activism of the emancipatory kind any way possible? And this paper answers that question by addressing three concerns I think are implicit in that question. First of all, how do socially dominant narratives actually sustain injustice? What are the mechanisms that emancipatory narrative activism has to disrupt? Secondly, how can we find robustly critical positions outside of the limits set by the narratives that sustain injustice? If they really generate constraints on thought and action, and manufacture consent to those constraints, how can we criticize them? Thirdly, under what circumstances can robust social criticism progress to constructive retelling of a disempowering narrative? And I argued in the book that a necessary prelude to doing that is what I've called the narrative self-reframing of those who've been subject to injustice. The point of my remarks today is to explain how that narrative self-reframing occurs and why it's a precondition for constructively retelling broader social narratives. So now I've just claimed that social narratives regulate social worlds by communicating normative constraints and manufacturing consent. But it's important to know that they do this by virtue of the interpretations they embody. The literary theorist um, Kenneth Burke talked about language as perspectival filters that shape the way we see the world. I want to argue that every narrative interpretation also functions as a perspectival filter. And what it does, it selects some happenings and states of affairs out as important while downplaying or even totally screening others out. And in socially dominant narratives, perspectival filtering is actually a way of expressing social valuation, of saying who counts, who has value. And um, narratives have the potential to regulate the social worlds they create in virtue of the implicit valuations they contain. But in a broader sense, socially dominant narratives create social meaning and determine social value in four domains. First, they help sustain a society's shared understandings of which agents and which events have historical importance. What should we remember? What should we celebrate? Second, they help sustain the, the group's sense of its collective identity actually usually through implicit understandings of who genuinely belongs to the group and why. Thirdly, they provide cultural instruction about desirable belief and action, here expressing normative expectations around such things as gender and age and race and ethnicity and class. And then fourthly, they function very often as vehicles for not just explaining but also legitimizing institutions and practices in which socially desirable actions fit. Now, in order to understand how narratives that have these characteristics sustain injustice, we need a clear picture of what justice is. And I've argued, in the, again, in Making Space for Justice, that the best account of what justice is actually emerges from the social criticism and political struggles that have shaped progressive social movements. 
I adopt what I've called, borrowing from some social, sociological theory, a cognitive approach to social movements, presuming that they are often able to generate deep insights about political life and its moral underpinnings, which can deepen social understanding and enrich philosophical reflection. There's a very Deweyan pragmatist account underlying this. One of the most important of the insights that social movements have produced is that treating people justly is treating them with humane regard. And by that, I mean treating them in ways that combine robust respect for their dignity as rational agents with compassionate concern for their capacity to suffer. And it's not unimportant that a lot of philosophers have thought these two um, attitudes towards people were incompatible because the robust respect seems to re require a moral distance and compassionate concern seems to demand moral connectedness. But I think the brilliance of, of most of the progressive social movements we could think about is that they think that's all wrong. That in fact, social justice is achieved when we find a way to strike the right balance between compassion and respect. And people are able to constructively exercise their capacity for choice and action without unwarranted interference, coercion, and violence, but also when they're able to live relatively free from unnecessary pain and suffering. So what this means is that social institutions and practices are just when they embody a robust commitment to humane regard. The problem is they're unlikely to do this unless they're shaped by narratives that embody humane regard. And I'm going to argue today that there are at least four ways in which socially dominant narratives can fail to do that. Four deficiencies are important here. Some social narratives involve what I call morally inadequate perspectival filtering. Others involve inaccurate or misleading representations of temporality. Thirdly, they can involve misleading impressions regarding the actual scope of the narrative. Does it claim to explain too much? And finally, do the narratives have or make unsupportable intimations of inevitability? And I'm going to explain in a moment what all, uh, whether what each of these examples comes to, um, what each kind of failure involves. So let me take the first kind of deficiency um, first. So there's an example of morally inadequate perspectival filtering in globally dominant narratives that existed prior to 1944, when the international jurist Ralph Lemkin actually developed what we now call the concept of genocide. He invented the concept. Prior to his work, there was no single term that was adequate to capture the idea of targeting a group of people for elimination and thereby attacking their very humanity. A powerful expression of the need for such a term had occurred in 1941 when Winston Churchill alluded in a radio speech to what he called a crime without a name while he was reporting atrocities that were committed by the Nazis, including mass executions of Soviet Jews, during the surprise invasion of the Soviet Union. And the concept of genocide actually helps to remedy this morally inadequate um, filtering. Secondly, there's inaccurate or misleading representations of temp temporality. By that, I just mean existence in time or in some way related to time. Um, there are lots of examples of this, but it's an especially potent mechanism for sustaining injustice when social roles that are defined by a narrative presume that those who occupy those roles are either frozen in time or somehow exist with no discernible relation to ordinary time at all. This is how the idea of the so-called happy slave that was very central to the narrative that supported slavery in the antebellum South in the US um, this narrative implied that the allegedly civilizing influence of Euro-American culture was a justifiable response to the enslaved person's essentially, supposedly rather essential and unchanging nature. And what it implied by that was that history was something that unfolded around the enslaved person rather than a process in which they might participate as independent agents. We find examples of narratives that embody the third kind of failure of humane regard. This is the misleading impressions about the scope of a narrative when we consider conspiracy theories, such as we hear very often, in fact, at this very moment in history, that purport to explain every undesired happening 
by alleging that people with certain racial, ethnic, or religious affiliations are somehow exercising malevolent control of important social and political institutions. And then fourthly, narratives contain misleading claims of inevitability when they assert that the social dominance of one nation or one group is justified because either it fulfills their supposed manifest destiny or meets an obligation to spread an allegedly superior culture. My argument is that social injustice is sustained and legitimized by narratives containing one or more of these four deficiencies. And I think there's some of them that actually contain all four. Now, my discussion is not providing incontrovertible proof that these deficiencies are, in fact, the primary mechanisms by which narratives support and sustain injustice. And this is going to lead some critics to be deeply skeptical. In particular, those theorists who believe that narratives can sustain injustice only when they function as a systematic or even relatively systematic set of beliefs, presuppositions, and commitments that purports to comprehensively explain and justify existing arrangements. Many contemporary social and political philosophers have even returned, so to speak, to the concept of ideology to capture the kind of systematicity they have in mind. But I submit that what is getting labeled as ideology in these accounts is actually just a socially dominant narrative or an interwoven set of such narratives that involves one or more of the failures of humane regard I've just described. And I note that the narratives that contain these failures emerge over time or evolve over time in ways that are not even remotely systematic. I've argued elsewhere that culturally influential frameworks, including socially dominant narratives, are complex but profoundly unsystematic phenomena that virtually always contain many internal inconsistencies and conceptual conflicts. Just consider that some narratives defining the role of the happy slave, for instance, existed a long time alongside narratives defining African descended people as permanent possibilities of danger. How can you be both happy and dangerous at the same time? Right? Systematicity has never been an essential feature of disempowering narratives. So many theorists who defend the appeal to ideology will nonetheless insist that when it comes to explaining how social narratives manufacture consent, their concept carries the day. They'll urge that ideology, along with the institutions it frames, survive by inhibiting or even entirely suppressing the capacity to question its commitments most often by obscuring, distorting, or falsifying crucial social and historical facts. But I claim that we can acknowledge that dominant narratives do indeed mask and distort critical facts without positing that their capacity to do so gives them some mysterious powers to inhibit or suppress criticism and contestation. Indeed, no narrative can itself suppress the capacity for social criticism, though of course violent repression and imprisonment of the social critics can. To be sure, even in the absence of violent repression, people sometimes fail to question narratives that sustain injustice, and this, this can be very troubling, right? But there are many reasons for this. Three, just three of the most important, are political inertia, people are a little lazy, right? Acknowledged or unacknowledged prejudice, and what Aquinas called affected ignorance, that is claiming not to know that something is wrong when one can and should know that it's wrong. Further, even when people do attempt to question social narratives, they may be quickly discouraged by the realization that ordinary social criticism is rarely sufficient alone to effectively contest dominant narratives. And one source of the difficulty something that I think actually Hannah Arendt does not pay enough attention to. She thinks everything's about ideas that makes institutions survive, but it's not. One of the difficulty is that narratives generate consent by appealing to emotions, sometimes ordinary emotions like hope and fear, but also quasi-cognitive attitudes such as racial resentment and xenophobia. And these things can be remarkably resistant to discursive rational argument because they're not all about belief. Right? This means that we must sometimes try to show what might be wrong with a narrative's commitments when discursive rational arguments 
attempting to say what is wrong fail to convince. And I acknowledge, regrettably, there's no formula for how to show this in any given case. And that can be unsettling when we think about people's failures to question. A second source of the difficulty confronting those who are inclined to criticize injustice is that while some societies may have a single widely accepted grand narrative, so to speak, that purports to provide a unified scheme of social regulation, complex societies are frequently characterized by internal disagreement about what even constitutes the official story. This is certainly true in the United States, for instance, as defenders of the New York Times' 1619 project have uh, very vividly <laughs> discovered. Equally important, even if there is substantive agreement in a given context about what counts as the grant narrative and the precise details of its content, any such narrative will always be supplemented by one or more influential secondary narratives. And these often stand in very complicated relationships to the grant narrative itself and to each other. And I think that sometimes people don't challenge narratives that sustain injustice or the challenges they make seem weak and deficient because they sometimes just don't know where to begin. Consider secondary narratives that sustain injustice because they are interdependent in problematic ways. As Martin Luther King urged in the famous letter from Birmingham jail, this is how the narratives that framed Jim Crow segregation worked. The narrative asserting the inferiority of those who were targets of Jim Crow's segregation was in inextricably intertwined with the narrative alleging the superiority of the segregators. And what this meant was it isn't really possible to challenge one of these narratives without targeting the other. And as history can, shows us, challenging them at the same time can be profoundly different difficult. In a second kind of case, secondary narratives may sustain injustice by virtue of the ways in which they intersect. For instance, as Kimberly Crenshaw has argued, narratives meant to determine the roles that African Americans should occupy in American life often intersect in disabling ways with narratives that define the role of women. And it may not be immediately clear how to contest both narratives at once, at least in a way that constructively challenges the injustice produced by their intersection. Now, I acknowledge that all of this complexity means that most people's lives are dominated by more than one powerful narrative, because even a single social role, professor at The Ohio State University, can be governed by several overlapping secondary narratives at once. Further, it can be remarkably difficult to disentangle any overlapping narratives that help to marginalize and disempower. Now, at this point, the, it, the theorists of ideology will say, OK, now, now we've got you. Because <laughs> you've just acknowledged that we're pretty thoroughly constituted as subjects through the workings of narratives that we didn't create. And the critic will say, you know, you've just proven to me how difficult it's going to be to find a position outside of such constitution from which to adopt a robustly critical stance. But I'm going to argue, first, that being embedded in more than one story can actually provide unexpected openings for constructive social criticism. And secondly, I'm even going to show that the seemingly most totalizing narratives cannot completely suppress the capacity to question those narratives' commitments. Indeed, I claim that even in societies with institutions and practices that produce significant multiple failures of humane regard, there will nonetheless be opportunities to mount effective challenges to those narratives. Four sources of narrative activism here merit special consideration. First, every narrative is contestable. And I'm not the only thinker to hold this view. One of the very um, accomplished theorists of narrative here at The Ohio State University, James Phelan, has devel developed a compelling argument for this claim in a 2008 essay of his called Narratives in Contest. It's really a wonderful essay. I recommend that people read it. He rightly concedes, I'll note, that contesting narratives can be difficult and sometimes even dangerous, right? Especially if the narrative under scrutiny has acquired something akin to a sacred status in a culture or if it has the strong endorsement of culturally powerful groups. Just ask Salman Rushdie about those dangers. 
But Fallon also notes that narratives typically under, excuse me, narrators typically understand that every narrative is contestable. And because of that, and here I quote from, from uh, Fallon, they are likely to construct their tale at least partly in response to or anticipation of one or more possible alternatives, end quote. Now, Fallon also contends, however, that even when a teller anticipates alternatives, critics can still manage to challenge the teller's story from a direction not anticipated by the narrative's author. And it's this phenomenon of unanticipated counter-narratives that, in my view, merits further reflection. In that essay, Professor Fallon doesn't say that much about how they're possible, so I'm going to offer just a few considerations to fill in the details, at least as they're relevant to challenging socially dominant narratives. To begin with, socially dominant narratives have rarely ever, rarely if ever, been created by a single teller who could be thought to anticipate anything at all, let alone to anticipate alternative narratives. Socially dominant narratives are usually an amalgamation of many different cultural um, culturally influential assumptions and intentions, and as such, they're the product of multiple, sometimes unknown authors who may have had remarkably different narrative aims. It's also important that narrative activists will often have access to well-documented facts which cast doubt on important elements of socially dominant narratives. Remember, defenders of American chattel slavery talked about happy slaves because they wanted everybody to think it was a essentially benign institution. But anybody who ever read Frederick Douglass's autobiographies, and he wrote three of them, will appreciate that the cruelty to which he and others were subjected while enslaved was a standing challenge to the claim of the happy, benign institution. Still further, narrative activists always have recourse to their own imagination as well as to the accumulated imaginative output of those who have championed their cause over time. And imagination, as I understand it, I won't go in great detail here, is a complex set of capacities that allow us to generate images, experience, ideas, interpretations, and stories that present us with unfamiliar possibilities and perspectives, but also stimulate novel reflection on what is familiar. This means that even relying only on the resources of your own imagination, it could be possible to generate fairly robust alternatives to socially constraining narratives. And then once you add in the imaginative output of others besides the subjects of injustice, the possibilities for alternative narratives increase dramatically. It's important that although Frederick Douglass sometimes seemed ambivalent about Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, he once described it, and I quote, as a flash to light a million campfires in front of the embattled hosts of slavery, which not all the waters of the Mississippi could extinguish. That's pretty powerful praise. The next two routes through which constructive narrative activism might emerge are perhaps unexpectedly consequences of the interdependence and the intersectionality that I talked about earlier that governs secondary narratives. Now, I'm going to acknowledge intersectionality is often a source of injustice. That's why Kimberly Crenshaw brought the phenomenon to public attention. She was trying to illuminate a fact about injustice, particularly in America, that was rarely acknowledged. But narratives sometimes intersect in ways that can be catalysts for constructive social criticism. I'm going to give you two examples. Consider first what can happen when a doctor is afflicted with a serious illness. Right? Her training may have encouraged her to accept narrative constructions of the patient as just a potential locus of various diseases and complaints. We've all been to doctors who think of us like that. But this stance will come under pressure when she experiences the vulnerability, uncertainty, and the sense of powerlessness that often come with being a patient undergoing treatment for a serious illness. In fact, sometimes such experiences dramatically increase a doctor's willingness to treat future patients as fully human beings and not just a locus of disease. In a second example, consider what happens when someone who comes from great privilege experiences, say, a severe hardship that the privilege cannot itself prevent. Uh, there are people who believe, as historians, try, try to explain Franklin Roosevelt's traitor 
uh, status to his class. How could he be this wealthy person and then turn to care about poverty and, and hardship? Some people say it was his debilitating bout, bout with polio that helps to explain the fervor of his commitment to the New Deal and to rethinking the role of government in order to realize its goals. There's a certain simplistic tendency in that explanation, but it may not be entirely irrelevant. Now, when it comes to interdependent narratives that function to disempower, I think such narratives sometimes generate so much cognitive dissonance and so much emotional discomfort that a subject can be forcefully moved to seek some means of transcending the constraints that those interdependent narratives help to sustain. Let's go back to Martin Luther King. In a letter from the Birmingham jail, he writes, I quote, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be play, plunged rather into the abyss of despair. That's, that's a quote. And I'll remind you that he's especially vehement in this passage about how difficult it was to explain to his children why they weren't welcome in the amusement park they frequently saw advertised on television. Accountability to explain, in quotes, injustice to vulnerable others can be a powerful additional element of the forces that serve to catalyze resistance to injustice sustained by interdependent narratives. Now, the fourth and final source of constructive narrative activism is the fact that even what seem to be totalizing narratives are always permeable in significant ways. Even when we confront narratives that sustain institutions intended to coercively control every aspect of our lives, we can still learn to recognize and reject the narrative distortions they contain. How do I know this? I learned it from Vaclav Havel, from a wonderful 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, in which Havel seeks to explain how it could be possible to contest the limits imposed by the despotism of the Soviet regime. I'm going to read two passages to you, and I, I hope they resonate with you as, as Havel, I think, would have wanted them to. Passage one. Individuals can be alienated from themselves only because there's something in them to alienate. The terrain of this violation is their authentic existence. Living the truth is thus directly woven into the texture of living a lie. It is the repressed alternative. That, remember that phrase, the repressed alternative. The authentic aim to which living a lie is an inauthentic response. And then here is the pa second passage, much shorter. Under the, under the orderly surface of the life of lies, therefore, there slumbers the hidden sphere of life in its real aims, of its hidden openness to truth. Now, as I read these passages, Havel is urging that even the most despotic, totalizing narrative cannot completely suppress the truth of human dignity or deny the moral weight of suffering caused by the injustices that um, it helps to sustain. Because we never lose the capacity to recognize the repressed alternative. And Havel's stance, I think, resonates in important ways with Professor Fe Felon's claims about the possibility of unanticipated counter narratives. And I add further that it offers reasons for rejecting what came, became kind of an influential position for a while because it was defended by the wonderful uh, pragmatist, contemporary pragmatist Richard Rorty. But Rorty made a number of very problematic claims. First, there's nothing, says Rorty, deep within human beings that might be damaged or distorted by injustice. Second, the human subject, Rorty said, is simply whatever acculturation makes of it. Third, there is no pre-linguistic consciousness to which language needs to be, ad be adequate. Everything about what Havel says in those two passages from the essay that I read you is a standing counterweight to Rorty's view. And on my, my view is the correct account, but I'll say a little more why. Now, totalizing narratives can certainly dampen the will to undertake narrative self-reframing. They can certainly discourage us from engaging in the political struggles to which criticism of disempowering narratives would typically lead. Consider this passage from the Polish solidarity activist, Zbigniew Buziak, describing the despair that he and his colleagues experienced before grasping the full significance of Vaclav Havel's essay. It came, oh, oh, you'll get the story about how it came to them. He writes that the essay initially reached them, and I quote, at a point 
when we felt we were near the end of the road. Why were we doing this? Why were we taking such risks? Not seeing any immediate and tangible results, we began to doubt the purposefulness of what we were doing." End quote. But Bujak goes on to observe that he and his colleagues eventually came to appreciate the constructive import of Havel's essay. And here I quote, then came the essay by Havel. Reading it gave us the theoretical underpinnings for our, our activity. It maintained our spirits. We did not give up. When I look at the victories of solidarity in Poland and of Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia, I see in them an astonishing fulfillment of the prophecies and knowledge contained in Havel's essay. So I think his comments help to validate Havel's confidence that there's a hidden truth under the orderly surface of totalitarian lies, but also that ordinary people have the capacity to grasp it. Of course, it also shows, I think, that collective political action, they're working together in the uh, pro protests of solidarity, plays a critical role in, narratives at, uh, in efforts at narrative self-reframing. So now I want to turn directly to the question in my final section of how that reframing is possible. So near the start of my remarks, I claimed that the narrative reframing, self-reframing of those who've been subject to injustice is a necessary condition of disempowering, or, sorry, a necessary condition of emancipatory narrative activism. In the previous section, I made the further claim that narrative self-reframing is a fundamentally collective project. And I think this is true, even though a small group of marginalized subjects, or even one such subject, can sometimes take the lead. We might suppose, for instance, that a 19th century slave narrative is simply an account of one subject's path to narrative self-reframing. But the literary scholar Henry Louis Gates has insisted, I think rightly, that such narratives were always collective tales. And in the terms of my account, slave narratives were making the case for collective emancipation by declaring the full humanity and the rightful claim to humane regard of all those who'd been subjected to chattel slavery. The essentially collective nature of emancipatory narrative activism, I think, is equally apparent in the process that shaped the growth of the 21st century at Me Too movement beyond the beginnings uh, in the efforts of its founder, Tarana Burke. The movement grew as victims of sexual assault and harassment began turning to social media to add their stories to the public record, the public record of women who'd experienced the psychic physical and economic toll taken by um, practices which sexually objectify women. And in so doing, they were acknowledging, I think, that narrative self-reframing can succeed only when it proceeds as part of a collective project. In fact, Catherine McKinnon, McKinnon said that the Me Too, at Me Too movement began as a powerful example of butterfly politics, by which she meant small gestures such as adding one's personal story to social media can over time lead to remarkably consequential outcomes. Visionary individuals sometimes recognize the need to take control of a narrative that initially seems to be about an individual experience of injustice and by taking control, reframe it as a collective experience of injustice demanding a collective response. I think this is what the mother of Emmett Till did in 1955, um, she understood, I think, that um, the story that her family was subjected to, what I'll, I'll describe in just a moment, was not just an individual an injustice, but it was an injustice that was really an attack on a group, the, the African Americans in general. Some of you may not know the story. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy from Chicago who, in August 1955, while he was visiting extended family in Mississippi was abducted at gunpoint and brutally lynched and murdered after being falsely charged with assaulting a white, a local white woman. His brutalized body was returned to his family. His mother insisted on having an open casket for the wake and funeral. And in fact, at her request, tens of thousands, some people think it was even 100,000, came to view his mangled body over several days, she even encouraged photojournalists to publish pictures of her son in the national press. She did this, I argue, because she recognized that the crime was not an attack on her son alone, but on every African American, a denial, in effect, that African Americans had a claim 
a valid claim to humane regard, and so she wisely reframed her loss as evidence of the need for collective political struggle um, to demand social acknowledgement of that claim. Now, this is going to be perhaps a little unsettling for some of us. I think this is why even people who don't believe in censorship, and I'm in that group, can still be troubled when reading comments made by the artist Dana Schutz to defend her painting entitled Open Casket that depicted Emmett Till in death. The painting came to public attention, some of you may know, when it was displayed in 2017 at an art exhibition called the Whitney Biennial in New York City, became the subject of vigorous critical attacks. In response to her critics, Ms. Schutz issued this statement, I'm gonna quote, I don't know what it's like to be black in America, but I do know what it's like to be a mother. Emmett was Mamie Till's only son. The thought of anything happening to your child is beyond comprehension. Their pain is your pain. My engagement with this image was through empathy with his mother, end quote. But anyone who knows even a little American history would realize that the thought of something terrible happening to an African American traveling in the Deep South in 1955 was certainly not, to use Ms. Schutz's phrase, beyond comprehension. In fact, the possibility was all too great. Moreover, I think we can reasonably, and I, I'm, be, I'm being respectful here, we can reasonably and respectfully wonder whether genuine empathy with Emmett's mother might not have revealed the importance of respecting her conclusion that despite her personal pain, her son's death was a collective loss that called for a collective response to violent white supremacy. Now, I continue to believe that her lack of insight into the layers of meaning associated with Emmett Till's story cannot license anyone except, whoops, sorry, except the artist herself to destroy the painting. It can't license anyone except the artist herself to prevent it from being publicly exhibited. And indeed, I think, had the painting in fact been destroyed or sequestered, we would all have lost a powerful catalyst for reflection on what it means to try to control these narratives around race and mourning in America. Now, some of us may wonder, how could she, how could the mother have looked beyond that personal suffering and pain that involves losing a child? But I think Havel's essay helps us understand. Her son's murder starkly revealed what Havel called, and I quote again, the hidden sphere of life and its real aims and produced what I think was a powerful, again, I quote, hidden openness to truth. Now, I know that his mother always knew he deserved humane regard, but I think Havel's right to suggest that sometimes you experience a special kind of awareness um, when the orderly sphere of life, to use his phrase, is somehow disrupted, and one suddenly confronts in very stark terms the divergence between disempowering narratives that sustain injustice and the humanity that a particular instance of justice has ignored. In fact, I think that it was just that sudden, stark awareness that actually sparked the extraordinary national and global Black Lives Matter protests that emerged in response to the 2020 murder of George Floyd. Never, at least in my view, had there been such an unambiguous display of the divergence between the humanity of those who become victims of police brutality and the inhumanity of those who uh, those actions, institutions, and narratives which sustain police brutality. I think it's important to acknowledge that works of art can sometimes produce the right kind of awareness, although I think it will never be as intense as the um, awareness produced by a given um, actual experience. But I want to say that a painting like Picasso's Guernica or a novel like Toni Morrison's Beloved um, can produce at least a similar kind of experience, and that's why it's morally wrong and epistemically wrong to censor them. Now, I've claimed that giving effective expression to the effects of awakening to a repressed alternative, that fact, for instance, of Emmett Till's uh, claim to humane regard, I've already said that it requires um, uh, understanding that it's a collective project, but what does this actually entail? What do I mean by that? I mean that fully shaping a dignity-affirming response to a disempowering narrative will almost always demand some kind of collective project of political struggle. This is confirmed by the efforts of solidarity, I think, in Poland. That's why I give you that example. 
It's, it, it's confirmed by the activists who engendered the Velvet Revolution in the former Czechoslovakia. That's why I talk about Václav Havel so much. Two decades earlier, Martin Luther King confirmed the value and importance of political struggle as the thing that helped to awaken a sense of effective political agency in the African Americans who participated in the projects, uh, in, in the protests, sorry. Now, once I make the claim that we can in, com successfully complete the socially transformative retelling of disempowering narratives only with a collective act of resistance, I think we also have to realize that that collective resistance ends up giving content to something that a theorist like Richard Rorty didn't understand. He doesn't just say that there's nothing outside of acculturation to be damaged. He says there's no such thing as the voice of the oppressed or the language of the victim, and that the task of putting the victim's experience into language must be done for them by someone else. But in her book, Talking Back, Thinking Feminist, Thinking Black, the feminist thinker Bell Hooks actually frames, I think, a very forceful response to this view when she says, for a group that's been stigmatized, marginalized, and disempowered, finding their own voice and not having it thrust on them from the outside is actually an essential part of the struggle for justice. But why is it so important for members of marginalized groups to find their own voice? I think the answer is that narrative self-reframing works only if it emerges from a process in which those who've been subject to injustice seek to remake themselves by means of narratives which they collectively construct for themselves. I think this is not just the best way to ensure that they'll control the narrative, but that it will, um, they'll be the best source really of the crucial details of what devastation injustice can produce, but also nuanced understandings of how to overcome it. Now, at this point, there will be critics who wonder whether the stance I've just defended is a veiled attempt to devalue the efforts of narrators who seek to contribute constructively to retelling narratives that have disempowered others. But I think all of you know that's not my aim, since I earlier acknowledged Uncle Tom's Cabin as a valuable inspiration to those who wanted to criticize chattel slavery. Of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe did not confront objections to what's sometimes described in language. It's a little bit of a trigger warning here. Dipping one's pen in someone else's blood for literary impact or familiar charges that fictional accounts of the suffering of marginalized others constitute cultural appropriation. I'm very troubled by some charges, so I want to offer a few suggestions about how to resist them. First of all, to the charge that producing fictional accounts of others' suffering is somehow cultural appropriation, I want to stress that a group's experience of suffering is not equivalent to the group's culture, even if important aspects of their culture have been shaped in response to their suffering. But equally important, we encourage a morally dangerous insularity if we insist that only people who've experienced suffering produced by injustice are somehow authorized to write about it. I don't think we want a world in which people are unwilling to try to put themselves in someone else's shoes and to try to imagine what it might be like to walk in those shoes, even if that path leads somewhere they never have to go. We must also reject the idea that the only narratives we can generally, genuinely learn from are those told by people who have roughly the same social experience we do. And here, I would like to quote a passage from James Baldwin, quote, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read, it was Dostoevsky and Dickens who taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. Dickens, uh, Tale of Two Cities was actually James Baldwin's favorite novel. Now, I want to say that anybody who thinks that Baldwin is wrong also has to understand that then they cannot resist the claims of recent critics of school districts teaching Toni Morrison's beloved to high school students that somehow if you're not African American, you have nothing to learn from Toni Morrison. So if you want to reject Baldwin, you have to, you have to go along with those people who don't want Toni Morrison's beloved taught. Now, I want to close these remarks by acknowledging that sometimes even a well-intentioned attempt 
to retell a narrative that sustained injustice towards others can get things wrong. Even when the retelling purports to track the truth more carefully than previous versions. It may even get them wrong in ways that further disempower the people it claimed to serve. I think this problem is vividly illustrated by a controversy that's recently emerged around a book called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Some of you may know that book by an author named Dee Brown. The book has sold 4 million copies. It's been translated into 17 language, languages since it was published in 1970. Brown wasn't himself a professional historian, and some of his critics noted that he didn't have any real substantive connection to any recognized tribal, tribal groups. But he claims in the book to found first-person statements, this is his language, by Indians in records of treaty councils and so forth that allowed him to produce what the subtitle describes as an Indian history of the American West. And he ends up claiming that after years of betrayal, he discovered from his inquiries that the 1890 massacre of 300 Lakota people at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, finally led to the complete destruction of Native American culture and civilization. In fact, the introduction to the first edition ends with the claim that all you have to do is look at Indian reservations, poverty, hopelessness, and squalor, and he's proven right. Now, as might be expected, some readers have taken issue with this book. One of the best known dissenters is an anthropologist and novelist, David Troyer, who grew up as a member of the Ojibwe tribe on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation in Minnesota. He went on to do an undergraduate degree at Princeton, actually writing a thesis under the direction of Toni Morrison, and earned a PhD in anthropology at the University of Michigan. And he's recently drawn on his academic training and his personal experience to produce what I think is a very rich counter-narrative to Brown's account. His counter-narrative is called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, Native America from 1890 to the Present. And I just read a little bit from that book because I want to make sure I have time to get in my last comments here. In the prologue to that book, Troyer writes of the deep personal dismay he experienced while he was reading Brown's book as an undergraduate and kind of describes the intensity with which he held on. And I hear I'm going to quote, to a small hot point of hope that I mattered, that where I was from mattered, and that someday I'd be able to explain to myself and to others why. And a few pages later, he tells us a story of how he conceived this book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. And in fact, it's become a very important counter narrative that's part of a larger retelling of the broader American narrative uh, that's involved a reframing of Native American life and culture. So what went wrong with this book? Bury my heart at Wounded Knee. My claim, it's like because I recently, I hadn't read it actually for many years and I reread it thinking about this paper. I think Brown actually offers an, a narrative about Native America that was t intended for everyone except Native Americans themselves. And as Native American writers began to consider that narrative through the lens of their own narrative self-reframing, the deficiencies of the project became clear. Analogous concerns have been raised by African-American historians about Catherine Stockett's novel, The Help, and then the popular film based on the novel, also called The Help. It purports to be a socially progressive story about growing interest in the mid 20th century in seeking racial justice in America. But the Association of Black Women Historians argued that although the book claims to express the concerns of black domestic workers in the American South of the 1960s, it actually distorts, ignores, and trivializes the experiences and the voices of those workers. Now, I think that for all their flaws, projects like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and The Help nonetheless yield an important lesson. They show that a narrative provides a genuinely empowering story of a marginalized group only if it can be recognized as empowering by a significant portion of the people at the story center. And I think everyone would agree that that did not turn out to be the case in either example. So finally, these examples confirm, I think, that constructively retelling dominant narratives always requires more than just the narrative self-reframing of the disempowered groups. It also requires what I've now come to call, I didn't use this label in the book, but I've now come to call it historical truth tracking activism to challenge historical narratives like D. Brown's, which claim to track the truth, but in fact serve to suppress it. 
Historian and legal theorist Annette Gordon-Reed produced just such a challenge when she contested history suppressing the truth about Thomas Jefferson's relationship with the enslaved woman Sally Hemings, including the fact that Jefferson fathered all six of Hemings' children. And when DNA studies established the truth of her claims, for many people, they strengthened broader worries that other important truths of American history may have been expressed, suppressed in service of exclusionary identities and oppressively xenophobic ways of life. Indeed, I believe that despite Plato's claims, there is unlikely to be anything noble about narratives which suppress the truth in order to sustain a way of life. And this is why narrative activism, both the emancipatory narrative activism and the truth-tracking activism I've just uh, described, um, are critical. They are important. Any group that's content to be less than co-authors of the narratives that define them will be confined to a perpetually disempowered status. And the only narratives that can empower a people and fully establish their title to humane regard are narratives that they have themselves helped to tell. Thank you. So if you have questions, uh, please come to the microphone. And um, those who participate online, please also feel free to share your questions. Hi. Um, I don't know that I have a well-formed question, but I just want to register as we were talking about, you're talking about narratives and counter-narratives, and uh, it's exhausting sounding at some level. Uh, it, you know, it, that, and maybe that's just life. And so there's no, so I, 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 this is a poorly formed version of my question. It's like, is there an end game that you have in mind to, to that process. And so, I mean, I was thinking about two different ways of thinking about it, and you might have a whole different way of thinking about it. One is to think about, well, at some, at some point, I'm thinking in the social political context, well, we'd like some kind of maximally rich narrative that accommodates all the things that uh, people uh, constructing these counter narratives and um, are, are, are teaching us so that we can try to incorporate them into a ri really fully rich narrative. And, and even then, of course, there'd be more to say, but so I, maybe that's just completely unrealistic. But the other thing that I guess I was thinking about kind of in the context of the liberal tradition, brought, very broadly speaking, is something about like the importance of a meta-narrative um, that um, celebrates all these narratives so that it seems, you know, so it creates room for lots of narratives to be told and celebrated and woven together in the way that you're describing so that it's not quite as exhausting because we are at some level committing ourselves to this meta narrative that helps us take a stance with respect to the, the, the constant um, narrative and counter narrative um, dynamics that you're describing. That's a great question. I'm actually going to stand up so I can see the folks on this side of the room too, if you don't mind. So I have to say, I don't think it's exhausting. I think it's part of being human. I, if you take just the individual case, over the course of a life, so many things happen to people that for the private narratives we construct, if you have an illness or an accident, or you get hitched you know, to somebody, or you enter a new phase of life, you come to The Ohio State University, or you go to, um, to get a degree in anthropology at Michigan, sorry, or um, whatever it is, you're always constructing a new narrative. That's just part of what it is to be human, is to try to make the world intelligible. I don't think it's exhausting. I think it's exhilarating. I think on the social level, we can think it's exhausting because we don't have as clear a sense of where the demand for new, re, new reframing will come from. You pretty much know, if you get sick, okay, I've got to figure out why did this happen to me and what do I do now? What's, you know, what's my story? There's so many um, entry points into the um, reframing, the reinterpretation that's demanded of us. 
but that's just what social life is about. The meta-narrative idea bothers me for the following reason, that the idea that you could for once and for all say this is what makes sense of all these other stories doesn't leave open the possibility that the meta-narrative itself may have to change dramatically. I mean, I think that's, that's, that is hard. I'm not sure if it's exhausting. It's hard. And it means there's uncertainty. But, you know, climate change in the current moment is one of those things that is really calling upon us to reframe the narratives we tell of our, why, what we do on this earth, what we ought to make of the natural world, our relationship to it, et cetera. That would be my thought. It's, you know, that's part of what makes history so much fun, that the, you can, each person brings their own perspectival filter. And the question is, is there some one time when we've told the history of America for good? I don't think so. Because I think that what America means to different people who come to America, or what you know, Denmark means, or what South Africa means, will de be dependent upon the experiences and the perspectives that each person brings. And we need to just accept that's the messiness of social life. Actually, I might stand up for a lot of people you questions. You know, maybe that's best. Yeah, I don't want to not see the people on the side of the room. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to, if I can, offer a correction to something you um, spoke about Emmett Till being accused. Uh, he was accused of, because it brings uh, shines a light on the culture at that time that he was accused of just speaking to a white woman. She claimed and he grabbed she her. she changed the narrative, twisted it, and said that he flirted with her. Knowing that this 14-year-old boy would not do that, but that ended and robbed him of his young life because of that. So you're talking about how people... Um, frame their own narratives or retell their own narratives of things, and that was a good example of what she did. And the other thing I wanted to say was, are narratives disempowered by not acknowledging the saliency of the narrative? When I say that, I mean certain narratives are challenged, and I want to bring attention to the educational system not wanting to um, teach critical race theory uh, like that's the only thing that would explain our history, but that, and um, because of the cultural nuances that can unfold and destabilize the structures that are already in place, which would suppress the truth in order to sustain a way of life. That's, that was kind of my question to you. Could you just say one, one more bit about the last point? I just didn't understand the last Well, point. I said that, um, they, uh, these changes and challenging, that they challenge narratives now about teaching history in school, okay? Because a lot of people don't know the history of black people's slavery, the whole thing on either side. I'm saying Europeans and blacks, they only know the present, a surface of it. They don't know how deep it really goes. And so, by bringing these things out in the open, it would suppress the truth, truths that they have, the structures, destabilize certain structures that they have in place now in order to sustain a way of life that they have now when you think of the caste system and right. such things of that right. nature. Right. So Okay. I am going to do two things. One of them is when they went to trial in the, Till, in the Emmett Till murder case, she had actually said he whistled and grabbed her. Oh. And then she pulls back. That, that's part of the challenge. A book that was written much later involved an interview with her right. in which she allegedly, anyway, recanted that grabbing claim. Yeah. When I grew up, I'm, so I'm from Chicago, the story was he just whistled. And then I was stunned right. to read that there was a larger charge, but that had also been recanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I completely agree with your worry about people suppressing truths that everyone needs to know. And it's not just that in the case of the history of African Americans in America, the history of lots of people in America that's not told, it's not just the group that's the subject of that history that's not um, being appreciated, 
or their history fully understood. Sometimes members of the group themselves don't even know the full history. Absolutely. And that's why it's a shame for it not to be told. I mean, I, I will say thirdly, I think it's not unimportant as much as I wouldn't want to censor the painting of Emmett Till in the, in the casket. The painter acknowledged, she even says at one point, I don't know much about American history. I don't know what it's like to be. But she actually says she, she claimed in a New Yorker interview that she had never understood what life in the American South really was like. So, and she actually grew up somewhere around Ohio, I think, which is interesting. But I agree with you, absolutely. I think suppressing and censoring history that might enlighten us, might upset us, and might cause shame or guilt, um, is, it, that makes it hard, but it's wrong to suppress. In fact, I have an article about that. I can, t I can tell you about it later. <clears throat> so we have a couple of questions from the online chat. Oh. Um, so we'll start with one of them. Okay. Oh, nice. um, so Andrew Goodhart writes, Professor Moody Adams, thank you for a fascinating and provocative talk. I study the use of narratives for social mobilization and separately, the sources of dissent against international governance efforts. It's clear from your work that narrative contestation is necessary to move toward justice. I'm curious, though, about how you think about a possible tension between this progressive impulse and the homogenizing potential of narratives in diverse societies. Um, do you see a way of distinguishing where we need to compete to achieve better shared narratives and where a diverse society is better served by multiple competing narratives? Mm. This, in a way, goes back to the very first worry. Do we want something that um, limits the number of narratives we have to be attending to all the time. And it actually gives us a sense of a shared story. We certainly want a shared story, but I want to argue that it needs to be open and inclusive, which means the content of the story may need to be, in some sense, always in flux, even if it's a single story, if it's going to make sense of the complexity of the perspectives that people bring to their social experience. Um, yeah, but I, I fully understand the dangers of um, seeming to create a kind of homogeneity when we propose to accept a single story. But I think the story can be open-ended and inclusive in ways that say, you know, we may need to revise it 10 years from now and still be a single story. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, talk. I was wondering, um, I was really interested in the, the Alistair McIntyre quote you mentioned that we are at best sort of co-authors of our own story, because uh, I think it speaks to, in general, the, the sort of ongoing debate between more communitarian, more individualist thinkers about uh, where our source of identity is found and whether it's entirely self-determined or whether it's found in the social roles that we inhabit. So. I was wondering from the perspective of narratives, to what extent do we have the ability to t determine our life narrative for ourselves, and to what extent is it kind of determined for us by our place in history and by our social roles as they exist? It's neither. We come into the world, as I, I agree with McIntyre, with a set of n n narratives in which we are embedded. But we create a story as we lead a life and the argument I'm trying to make is that if we create that story intentionally and in a way that is attentive to the, the ways in which some stories seek to, uh, to treat us as though we're not fully human or to subject us to injustice, we can become co-authors of the stories that shape our lives in a constructive way. I do think we're never more than co-authors. I went through a stretch in my life when I thought, I mean, I was the, you know, autonomous individual. And then, of course, you know, you don't have to even read Shakespeare. There's a divinity that, you know, shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. You don't have to believe that. But I think you can't ignore the extent to which some roles that define you in important ways, and some you want to define you. You're someone's child. You're someone's brother. You know, I, I'm a Chicagoan. You, ask me about what that means. I am so much, I, I should work for the Chamber of Commerce. That's very much a part of who I am, but that's not all that I am. And to my mind, the most um, important, morally and politically important truth one could accept is that you can 
acknowledge the parts of your life that are shaped by narratives you don't create, even as you're trying to sometimes retell the narrative in ways that accommodate stories that you think matter to shaping your, lo your own life. Am I making any sense with that? Yeah, yeah thanks so much, appreciate it. Hello, um, earlier you mentioned the Me Too movement, which occurred largely online. So I just wanted to ask what your thoughts are on the effectiveness of social media as a tool for emancipatory narrative activism and the establishment of collective political movements. That's a great question. I'll tell you, I think my answer right now would be, in fact it would be, it's better for the emancipatory, excuse me, it's better for the narrative activism part than it is for the actual political struggle part. There's a book by Zeynep Tufeki, sociologist, it's called Twitter and Tear Gas, I won't remember the subtitle, in which she actually says, you can get a lot done, and, and this is how the beginning of the Arab Spring unfolded through social media. But sometimes a movement will not succeed, in fact, maybe most of the time, unless you have a clear sense of the kind of foe, the opponent in some way you have to fight against, unless you secondly know how to have organization that functions in the real world and not just online. These are just two of the things. And this was what was missing in some of the cases, even where social media allowed people to gather without being detected and without surveillance. But then once they gathered, the idea of making constructive political struggle became much easier to, much more difficult rather, uh, to fulfill. So I think the, the narrative activism and even other kinds of activism that are not about the political on the ground struggle, they work very well online, but sometimes the online struggle actually gets in the way of genuine organization that makes a movement able to succeed. Hi, thank Hi. you. Uh, I had a question about Frederick Douglass and the conditions for counter-narratives being emancipatory. So I agree he seems like a very powerful example, but it's interesting to me that at times he also seems to reflect on the limitations of narrative. He talks about Garrisonian abolitionists telling him to tell his story and we'll take care of the philosophy. Um, and says, well, at a certain point, I, I didn't just want to narrate the wrongs I'd suffered, I wanted to denounce them. So that might just be about the constraints of narrating sort of within the parameters set by somebody else, but I wonder whether it also points to limitations of narrative itself. Yeah, I think some of what he's doing in his own autobiographical narratives is actually involving the denunciation he doesn't necessarily point to the parts that are the denunciation. But I think the fact that he struggles, for instance, with the Kobe, the slave breaker story, you know, more than once, it's in more than one of the narratives, that's where the denunciation, I think, is coming through, where it's, he's a sort of, I'm taking control of this act of resistance, even just the way I describe the act changes. So I think denunciation can come through in a narrative project. It's just a function of how the narrative itself is shaped. Um, does that seem to address the yeah, worries you have? But I agree, there was the narrative construction of the Garrisonians, and he's clearly distancing himself from that. It just wasn't going to enable him to do what he wanted to do. Um, cool, we have one more question from the online audience. Uh, so Henry Lara is a PhD student in education, and he asks, can I ask the speaker to say a little bit more about the relationship between conspiracy theories and narratives? Um, so conspiracy uh, theories tend to follow a format or pattern that makes them easy to identify. So he says that they're not, not falsifiable, self-closing, involve people planning and getting away with major things. Um, but narratives seem, like a lot of narratives seem harder to identify, and therefore, with regards to addressing them via education, for example, harder to uh, address. Yeah, conspiracy theory, I mean, I'm calling it a narrative. It, it does purport to tell a story about why things are happening in one way rather than another. Other varieties of narrative may be less easily labeled and identified. You, you know, you can label something as a, an autobiography or as a memoir or a biography or um, 
even just a narrative that unites two events, as I talked about early on in the paper. There are no easy labels for the other ones, um, but I do think there are narratives that, I mean, I gave the four deficiencies that I think are present when one or more are, is, are present when some narrative is failing to display humane regard. You don't need to have a name for the kind of narrative that is displaying the deficiency to be able to say this is wrong, this is what you don't want. I hope that answer is sufficient. Conspiracy is one of them, but you know the, the narrative that leaves something important out, that was the story that had to be filled in by the concept of genocide. If Churchill is saying it's a crime without a name, there's something there that internationally we needed to address and respond to. Um, but I don't know that I have a name for the narrative that gets framed around it. Thank you for your talk earlier. Um, so in our retelling of the dominant narratives, I was wondering how you think we should reconcile or talk about past yeah. narratives that we've now like understand, or we now understand differently, yeah. or like how we should represent these now replaced dominant oppressive narratives wow. um, without reinstating them. That's a good point. You know, there's no single answer to that. It depends on how constraining, I think, and how confining the roles associated with any given past narrative might have been. But I think even the narratives that have the most confining, constraining roles, you don't want to just forget them. We were talking at lunch um, about the efforts in Germany to remember, not to commemorate or celebrate, but to remember the facts of Nazism and the Holocaust that followed on it, right? That you want to be able to say, here is this thing that happened. Let's not do this again. This is evil. We can't let this happen again. If you don't keep some record of it, you might, you know, this is Santayana, the great um, philosopher who said, you know, if you don't remember the history, you're doomed in some ways to repeat it. But the, it's a hard thing. Great architects. I, I met the architect Peter Eisenman who designed the Berlin Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. He said to me in a conversation, this is when I was teaching at Cornell, he said, I don't want anything to do with that project of remembering Nazism. It was actually Munich was building a museum in which they wanted to put certain kinds of things as a way to remember, not to commemorate. He said, I don't know how to remember that without seeming to celebrate it. It's not an easy thing. You're absolutely right. And I mean, there are people who've tried it. Uh, I forget they call it the, the Nazi Documentation Center. I think that, and there may be others. That, the one I'm thinking of is in Munich. There are other examples in other cities in Germany. If they've done it right, maybe we could go look at how they've done it. How do they tell that story without reinstating or the um, evil that it embodied? Be, it'd be a thing to see. But as I said, there are people who think they don't know how to do it, so. So this, this is a kind of more of a vague question. Um, <clears throat> you spoke a lot on the consideration it takes to form a valid narrative. And I was, consider, I was wondering what your thoughts on what it takes to um, qualify an empowering narrative when you're speaking on a disempowering subject. Say, say that once, to qualify or? To, to frame, to an, frame empower, okay. an empowering narrative, yeah. When you're speaking, can you give me an example of what you mean by disempowering subject? I think I know, but I don't want to read something into your comment that's not. Just uh, a subject that, um, like, the, the, the woman's suffrage struggle of, um, of uh, the early 19th, 20th century. Okay. Well, that's in effect, I think, what lots of social movements have been trying to do to acknowledge the truth of the um, injustices the group they're a part of has experienced, and then to try to find a way to rethink their own status in the world, their own self-conceptions, but also to demand new ways of being seen by the dominant culture. We do, you know, people do it in lots of different ways. You're right, it is an issue, 
I don't think there's a formula for how to do it. It may depend upon what point in history you come, what's come before you. Are you building on efforts that other people who've undertaken that project have already made? I actually think, I don't talk about this in the paper, um, the concept of sexual harassment, I think, is one where, so there's a moment in 1974, actually at Cornell University, and in a class, it was actually like a consciousness raising class that was a section of another class, some kind of sociological issue. And there's a group of women sitting around and they're bandying about different titles for the things that have been happening to them, different language, they come upon the language of sexual harassment, but that didn't really just come out of the air. There were people, women suffrage, suffragettes, who'd been you know, protesting and insisting that there were ways of treating women that were wrong. Um, and they were building, sometimes in unacknowledged ways on that. So I don't, it's a good question. I don't know if there's a formula for it. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for your question. Well, if there's no other question, let's thank our speaker. Thank you for the questions, too. That was great.